Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything podcast number 221. This is the Tuesday, August 7th edition of the show. I'm Gary. We've got Chris here. You can follow us on Twitter at Winning Cures. You can get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Winning Cures Everything. Lots to discuss today. Uh, we have an interview with Muhammad Massaqua, former Georgia wide receiver, former Cleveland Browns wide receiver. We bring in John Lacombe from the West Lot Pirates, the Northwestern podcast, to uh, to give us some Big Ten insight on the Urban Meyer situation. We're going to go through some blurbs. We're going to discuss uh, Conor McGregor, all kinds of different things. Uh, so let's go on and jump into that. But first off, as always, the show is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Best online sports we got there. They got the best layouts, the best odds. Uh, go check it out. MyBookie.ag, promo code WCE50. That's WCE50 for a 50% deposit bonus. What that means is you put in 100 bucks, they're going to give you 50 You put in 50 bucks, they're going to give you 25 Either way, it's free money. And nothing beats free money. So, mybookie.ag, promo code WCE50. Along with that, the show is brought to you by winningcureseverything.com. There are stories and videos and all sorts of stuff over at the website. So go check that thing out. Sign up on the email list. And make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, all your favorite podcast apps. And hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. That's always a big thing now. Uh, we are we are putting all of our segments up on YouTube. You can go check it out. You can comment. Uh, but make sure you subscribe. Go on and knock that thing out. And uh, and let's go on and start off. We're going to get into an interview with uh, Muhammad Masakwai, the wide receiver from Georgia and the Cleveland Browns. Right, so we've got former Georgia Bulldog and Cleveland Browns wide receiver Muhammad Masakwai. Before we talk about the upcoming football season, I want to go on and talk about you for a little bit. Is that all right? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So let, let's just start off with the ATV accident and the prosthetic. Now, trying not to be disrespectful, this thing looks awesome. Like, it's, if, if anybody wants to know more about it, there's a Players' Tribune video where you explain what happened with the accident. But I, I want to know more about the prosthetic. Like, you lost four fingers. And this uh, this robotic yeah. thing allows you it, it your hand is fully functional, right? So just first, just thank God for technology. Uh, not knowing what was out there, you never want to lose anybody part. But in being able to have the device that I have currently, it makes it a lot easier when you have something that looks the way that it does and it functions it the way it does, and it's just uh, amazing where technology has has come thus far. So is it like it? It's all. I mean, you you control it with uh, with like your mind, right? Like I, so, I don't know how this stuff works. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, everybody's like, man, is it Iron Man? Is it uh, Luke Skywalker? <laughs> like is it mentally controlled? How it works is that there's sensors inside of it, okay, and your muscles fire off electricity. Not to get too scientific, whenever you're moving them, and what they do is they attach sensors to those places that have electricity going through them. And then whenever you make a gesture, your hand opens and closes. So my particular device is from a company called Touch Bionics. And what they've done is just really just enable people like me just to get a lot of their function back. Um, I have four moving fingers that, that, that move individually. Uh, it's all carbon fiber. So that uh, from an eye, eye test, it definitely passes that. So get stopped a lot by kids and random people in the yeah. airport wanting to see it. Or I, I can only imagine. T Touch Bionics, that in and of itself sounds like something out of like an Iron Man movie. Um, but like if you oh, wanted yeah, to, yeah, if yeah, you wanted to flip somebody off, you could do that, right? Like you'd have no problem. I, I, I could. You probably wouldn't see it on camera just so it go viral, <laughs> but uh, I, I've done it a time or two before. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine. I, all right, so uh, so we've got all of that. Let's, uh, hey Chris, you want to jump in with uh, with some NFL stuff and whatnot? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get talking about a few things. We're gonna we want to hear some stories from you from your NFL days, your college days, and we're gonna talk about the upcoming season. Um, I never want to be disrespectful and ask somebody to tell a story about somebody else because you have stories that are unbelievable, and you got to be able to play at, a, at an amazingly high level, but. You happen to play with – I'm the resident Cleveland Brown fan. I'm kind of the only okay. one around where we live. 
And you're you're a loyal fan. Cleveland, yeah, right. Bat- Believe Cleveland that. Brown fans are the most loyal fans in the world. So, uh, so you you, thank you you had the luxury of playing with who, and I don't mean to disrespect you or anything. With, in my opinion, the greatest offensive lineman to ever play the game of football, and one of my heroes, and Joe Thomas. He's kind of a crazy guy. Do you have a crazy Joe Thomas story? If you don't, it's totally fine. If you do, <laughs> I would really like to hear. Well, it. Well, it, it, there's no disrespect when you mention Joe Thomas' name. I mean, he, he is one of the greatest players, uh, not only to put a Cleveland Browns jersey on, but just to put any sports jersey on, basketball, football, baseball, whatever you name it. Uh, he's a guy who, he, you know the weather that we played in, in Cleveland and the guys still have to face this year. And he being from Wisconsin, he calls that God's country, and he loves it. Uh, the colder, the better. Uh, on his negative dec- decrees outside, he's the guy out there with his shirt off and just enjoying it as if he's walking on a beach in Florida. So uh, that will probably be the only flaw that Joe Thomas has, <laughs> is, is loving the cold weather too much. But outside of that, uh, he's as solid as they come. He's as good as they come. And I hate that as it appears the Browns are about to turn the corner that he's uh, transitioned out to uh, a few other things. All right, now you were – I want to get back on you. You were drafted in the second round of the Browns. Uh, you came out of Georgia. Yeah. You played with the Browns from 2009 to 2012. Now, back in 2009, the Browns maybe didn't feel as hopeless as they have the last few years. What was your first thought when you got the call from them? Like, at first, were you at the draft or did you watch it at home with the family? And then – when it was the Browns calling, what did you think? Uh, well, I watched it at home with the, fam- with the family, and I'm originally from Charlotte, um, and I- I'm a Southern guy, and we don't really get much coverage on-, on the Browns. And, you know, forgive me for this, but North Carolina is a big basketball state, so oh, yeah. most of our focus goes on Charlotte Hornet. But look, we're in Memphis. Came to town. Like, Memphis is Hoop City, so, like, we, we understand that. Ah, uh, don't 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 do that. Don't do that. Shit. Uh, North, North North Carolina. <laughs> Let, let's keep it on North Carolina. Uh, but uh, I, I will say that that my knowledge of the Browns was was um, vague at best. So I, I actually went in with a with a clean slate, not not really knowing much, and starting to educate myself when I when I got there. And it, it's one of those places that is very rich in culture, as you know. Um, winning tradition. It hasn't been like that in the last few years. But very, very prideful group. And I always tell people, I, I know when LeBron came back, it was a big deal. But if the Browns are able to make a serious run or, you know, win a national, not a national, but a Super Bowl, then I I don't know what they'll do to that place. Uh, they'll, they'll just be overjoyed. I hope the city is still standing afterwards. Oh, I could only imagine. I'll, I'll be there if that ever happens. There's no, <laughs> no doubt in my mind. <laughs> So. I think you and every Browns fan from around the world will, will be in Cleveland. P- Pilgrim is back. That's right. So I want to ask you about some of your coaches that you played for. You played in college under Mark Rick, unbelievable college mm-hmm. coach. Everybody in the country knows him. And in the pros, mm-hmm. you played under Eric Mangini and then a guy who just got his second head coaching job in Pat Shermer this year. Uh, what mm-hmm. do those guys have in common that made them, you know, be, I guess, able to get jobs at that kind of level? And then how are they just all different? Well, first, I mean, obviously, to, to get, get a job at that level, no one does it by luck. So you, you're dealing with everyone that um, high football IQ, um, guys that, that they understand what it, what it takes to win. They had success from the places that they were coming from. I'll, I'll start with Coach Rick, who um, is different than, than most coaches. Obviously, he leads with his – uh, faith background, and he's able to get a lot of just great players that that way. And um, he's an offensive-minded guy. He, he learned up there, uh, Bobby Bowden down in Florida State, and um, we learned a lot of things. We were able to have a lot of success, and now he's a guy who has, um, I, I think, is just rejuvenated going back home and being in the Miami Hurricanes atmosphere all over again. I'm, I'm hoping that he's able to get a national championship down there, not before Georgia. Um, <laughs> but I do hope he gets one um, soon, sooner to right, rather than later. And then you have uh, Mangini, who's probably closer to, I would say, your, your Bill Belichick. And with with him, defensive-minded guy, hard, hard-nosed guy. No nonsense. Um, and, and if you remember, he, he had some success at um, his the stop before us, and it's, 
it's one of those things that in, in the NFL, likewise with, with Pat Shermer, who's, um, you see he had success with the Minnesota Vikings last, last year, and now he's going to New York. Uh, sometimes when you're a second stop, uh, speaking about Pat Shermer now, you, you, you know, you, you learn more, you, you've been under the fire, you understand how to manage a team, you understand how to manage players, you understand situational football better. Um, you just have more experience. So I, I'm thinking that uh, Pat Shermer's, uh, second go around will be a lot different than his go around with the Browns. And I think Manzini was a case that had he had a little bit more time with the Browns, potentially um, things would have turned out a little bit different. I, I think that when Holmgren and his staff came, you start to see a softer side of Manzini inside to start to uh, relate to the players a little bit better. So you just never know um, with some of these things uh, with Coach Rick, had had the Alabama game gone a little bit different um, on the five yard line, maybe he's the, the the guy that brings the national championship to Georgia. But that's not the case. Um, maybe with Mangini, if a couple things go differently now that Shermer's in the Big Apple, maybe things go different with uh, Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham Jr. You you just never know with coaching. And there's a lot of good coaches where their record doesn't always show, but um, Coach Rick and Shermer, they're they're having second chances. So we'll we'll see what happens uh, with it. Not, I'm not sure what Manji is doing now. Probably. Uh, I, I think he's doing TV. So. I think. I'm not real sure about that. Oh, he's on. <laughs> the, the irony. He, he never liked talking to the media. Now he's, uh, but he becomes the media. The yeah. That's right. Well, when you got a brain like that, sometimes that's just what you got to do. Now, tell me you this. You got to share that knowledge. Uh, aside from the head coaches. How much of your play is is based on – well, maybe I'm asking this wrong. I, I want to know what the role of, like, the position coach and coordinator is as opposed to the head coach. Which one has more of an effect on you as far as your play goes? Um, I would say think of the head coach as probably the CEO, that they're dealing with a lot more outside of just the X's and O's. They're, they're basically dealing with the whole organization top down. And, and making sure that, that things are run smoothly across, whether it's the training room, uh, the weight room, players, contracts, all that good stuff. And then your uh, coordinators are strictly focused on, okay, how does this offense or defense work together? And it's up to the position coach to make sure that uh, at the granular level that the players know exactly what they're doing and to prepare for them. So uh, with the head coach, uh, the, the players obviously have great – relationships with it but we're more so focused on the coordinator and our position coach and if you have a a coach let's say like um coach rick you know he's going to be more hands-on with the offense if you have a guy like my he's probably going to be a little more hands-on with the defense making sure that that's polished up because that that's their sweet spot but especially for young talent the position coaches are crucial just because whether you're coming into the sec or you're coming into the nsl there's so much that you have to learn to get acclimated to the game. And if you don't have exceptional vets on the team, sometimes that transition can be a little tricky. So it's up for them to catch you up to speed. Uh, and sometimes it's for them to find the right guys to make sure that they can do what they're trying to teach them. So they're kind of playing both sides. Okay. All right. I, I want to have a little fun with you. And I'm going to get Chris to ask Let's this go. question. Yeah. You were with the Browns for four years. So from 09 to 2012. Mm-hmm. You had seven starting quarterbacks. Now, we've got a list. Yeah. Can you name all seven of them? <laughs> I, I can. Uh, Brady <laughs> Quinn, who I actually saw about two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, Derek Anderson, who is, is still a good friend of mine as well. Jake DeLome, he came from the Panthers, so I, I was a big fan of him. I'm from Charlotte. Then you have Seneca Wallace, who is doing really well in arena football right now. Uh, Pope McCoy. Um, you have uh, Brandon Whedon. Uh, I'm trying to see was Thad Lewis in that rotation. That's Thad Lewis's um, last one. <laughs> Man, you yeah, knocked Thad, that out like nothing. Thad, Thad Lewis. <laughs> um, and then you you can even get uh, Josh Cribbs in there with his, with his Wildcat. That's so, right. I, uh, that, that is absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> the Wildcat. Yeah, Cribs, that's, uh, did he ever throw you uh, any passes from the Wildcat? Uh, he was supposed to, but he always took off the ramp, <laughs> He just so. took the he just took the ball and said, "I'm not giving this up. This is mine." <laughs> Yeah, and, and so in great. practice, uh, he would throw them, and then in the games, he turned into uh, a, a returner. I think he'd just forget and think that we were supposed to be blocking for him. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, ideally, you wouldn't play with that many quarterbacks. But the benefit is that you make a lot of friends. So uh, I, I can't believe you named them that quick. <laughs> so you didn't even have to think about it. Man, yeah, it's like well, you had a list in front of you or something. That's kind of the, that's kind of been the Cleveland thing. Is uh, is just running through. Well, uh, hope, hopefully that that I've seen the jersey uh, that has like fifty names on it. That's and right. Hopefully they can put it in, into that with Tyrod or. Uh, Baker Mayfield. Hey, I'm a huge Tyrod fan this year. We'll that, get we, into that. Yeah, we're going to get to that here in a minute. I'm going to ask you one more question about being recruited because we talk, we cover a lot of college football recruiting and stuff. What all schools were recruiting you out of high school? What were your list and and what made you pick Georgia? Um, wow. Well, that re- recruiting actually turns into a, a headache for some guys because you have so many coaches reaching out to you and it's a huge blessing but when you're 16 17 18 you really don't know what all of it means especially in the area that i grew up in this was before social media and the internet and everything so it was all very very new i was the first person in my family to even go to college let alone get a get a scholarship so Man. i i think that um for for me i had the opportunity to really go anywhere that i wanted and every week I would literally change my mind just because you see the next shiny thing. North Carolina does something, you go to North Carolina. Tennessee does something, you go to Tennessee. Uh, USC is one engaged. You're like, oh, I should take a visit out there. I haven't been, but I think I'm going to commit whenever I go. And it got so overwhelming that my mom was literally like, okay, you figure it out, and whenever you're ready to make a true decision, I sign on the line and then wrap me in. But uh, my <laughs> high school quarterback. Uh, so so wait, wait, Cox, your, your mom was not, uh, was not yeah. super involved in it? No, she was super involved in it, but a lot of times parents would let the, the kids make the decision because ultimately you're the one that has to yeah. play there. You have to do things. But I think that she knew that next week it would change. So just to let me get all the, the <laughs> nonsense out the way and whenever I was ready to make a, an adult decision to, to bring her back into the loop. Okay. Uh, okay. But she went everywhere. She was on most of the calls. She knew everything that was going on. But it's literally like, oh, if you go somewhere, you're like, oh, I want one of those, I want one of those. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of what, what happened until probably entering into my senior year when I started to make more sense of the whole thing. And I actually ended up committing early. And it, it worked out really well. Joe Cox, my high school quarterback, we were, um, you know, just going through summer workouts. And he was like, hey, I want to go for a um, camp down in Georgia. Will you go with me? And I was like, sure. Georgia had offered me at the time, but I didn't know much about it. Uh, I hadn't taken a visit there yet, and we went. He got a scholarship offer. He committed the next day, and he actually became the guy that started to recruit me. And at the time, I want to say Tennessee was real heavy up on the list, and I'm glad I didn't commit there. <laughs> but uh, he, he he became the, the, the guy that, 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 that made Georgia very real to me, and when I looked at it, made complete sense with Fred Gibson and – Reggie Brown leaving and, you know, the success that they had had up until that point. So it, it was a good decision uh, in the long run. Well, Athens is a beautiful place. I've never been to a game there, but I've been on campus. Man, that place is gorgeous. You should. You should add that to your bucket list. It's, uh, it's on the one list. One of the best sports experiences. It's, it's definitely on the list. Let's, let's talk about Georgia a little bit. I, I've got one main thing because I, I went through, I was looking at stats and whatnot. And, look, you're, uh, you're season high in receptions every season that you played was against Georgia Tech. Now, what was the reason <laughs> you were used more against the Yellow Jackets? Is that – tell me, is that a real rivalry or is it just kind of one-sided? Like, it, does Georgia Tech hate Georgia more and Georgia hates Florida or whoever? Or or is it like – is it real deal? I, I think the, the, the thing that's, that's tough is because there's true hatred in uh, among so many teams like – Georgia legitimately hates Florida. Georgia legitimately hates Auburn. Georgia legitimately hates um, every team in the SEC. <laughs> and when it comes to Georgia Tech, because we share the same state, uh, we just don't want to lose to those guys. We, people have family members. They have, yeah. All right, so uh, so we'll pick up where you left off. Um, you were talking right. about how much uh, you know Georgia fans hate basically everybody, and in that state – Georgia Tech and Georgia fans are, you know, they're in each other's family. They don't want to lose to each other. Um, and so, uh, tell me, tell me about you and and how you ended up with that many receptions every time you played them. Like it was your season high, literally every year. 
it, you know what I think it is, is it's my birthday. My birthday's November 24th, and it always falls around <laughs> Thanksgiving weekend. And I, I want to say it's just a, a good birthday gift from so, so Coach uh, Rick, Mike Bobo and yeah, Matt and they hooked you up. So. That, that's probably like the only thing I can attribute it to. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. And that's a good birthday time. I'm a 22nd birthday for it's November. A, it's so. a good birthday. Yeah. 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 Right yeah. around Thanksgiving. No, You're always no around better family. way to give a birthday gift other than to give a receiver a hope we should pass it. So, yeah. There you go. All right. Let, let's talk about 2018 college football. Uh, it, is okay. there a surprise team that could pop up in the SEC this season or even in coming years? Or is this just going to be Alabama Georgia's conference for years and years to come? Well, Georgia did it last year. I don't think anyone expected us to arrive to the party as fast as we did no. uh, without a VIP pass at that. You know, uh, so I I wouldn't put it past South Carolina. I wouldn't put it past Florida, uh, LSU, Tennessee. These guys are recruiting the same athletes and the same type of players that we are. Even when the record is bad, the, the players are still good. It's just some things that aren't clicking for the team as a unit. So we can't go into any game this year, whether it's Vanderbilt or Kentucky or some of the other teams that, that don't appear to be uh, powerhouses. But in saying that, I fully expect us to, to have a rematch with uh, Alabama again. I, I think I agree. I'll tell you this. We put out our SEC East previews. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I picked Georgia to go eleven and one, but I picked them to lose to South Carolina. Chris over here had them nine and three. I don't even know what he was thinking. But I, it, Come on look, now. Yeah, I, don't, don't I tell know. him that. Don't Chris, tell him that. Chris, I don't, yeah. <laughs> don't tell him that. Look, eleven and one, I thought was pretty reasonable, right? So last year, Georgia goes into Auburn. It was the the only real hostile environment that Georgia played in. And this year, the only real hostile environment, it, it, unless you want to count Kentucky or whatever, but a hostile environment that, that they could lose, I thought they might get caught by South Carolina in week two. Am I crazy for thinking that? Because Georgia fans have been all over me telling me we're not losing to South Carolina. You know, I don't care what week it is. We got more players than they do, et cetera. Is 11-1 and one not realistic? I think it's realistic. I think that, especially when you look at South Carolina, they've been considered probably the fourth team in the East for a long time, always behind that uh, revolving door that's Tennessee, Florida, Georgia. So I think this is their time to figure out, you know, can they uh, emerge as one of the SEC leaders now that the uncertainty with Florida and Tennessee is up for grabs and the timing of which they're playing Georgia when we're trying to figure it out, losing all the talent that we had last year. So I, I think it's a, a a chance, anything's a chance, but I, I want to say that one of the best things that probably happened for our program is the way that Auburn game happened the first time we played them just because it was one of those things where we were riding high and we got knocked off our horse. And Kirby can always use that as a reference. And a lot of the guys that are currently there understand what it feels like to go into a place and, and basically, you know, get beat up uh, – but the thing that did happen, the way that we rebounded that same team in the SEC championship, I think that's the type of performance that you can expect whenever we start to go in those hostile environments uh, and put our best foot forward. All right. Now, I, I want to get just a, a quick preview of the SEC from you. I'm going to read off a few Vegas win totals, rapid-fire style. Okay. I just want you to tell me over-under, all right? Okay. All right. LSU, they're over-under is seven. They're going over-under. Over. All right. Auburn, they've got it nine. Even. Even? Okay. Uh, they've got Florida at eight and a half. Over. Ooh, all right. Ooh, all right. Okay. You like Dan Mullen then. I th- <laughs> I, no, I mean, I mean to, to go eight and four is a matter of uh, how Florida would want their season to go. I think they can win eight games, though. Okay. Or okay. Nine, you know, yeah. One or the other. Either either way, you think it'll be around eight and four, nine and three. Uh, Texas A yeah. and M, they've got it seven. So, what, what do you think about Jimbo Fisher? You think he gets that turnaround? No, I think he's right right around. It. He has, he has a lot that he has to overcome over there. Okay. Okay. And then they've got South Carolina at seven. This will be the last one. South Carolina at seven. Over. Over. I like that. I like that. All right. Let's uh, let's close up with some NFL talk. 
Uh, how many games do the Browns win this year? Nine. At least nine. I love it. Nine this, wins? This, this is it right here. All right, now, now is this because of Tyrod Taylor or is this because of Baker Mayfield? I think it's because of Tyrod Taylor. Uh, I'll answer it like this. If Baker Mayfield wins the job, he's extremely special because Tyrod is a solid quarterback and you saw what he did for Buffalo last year. He is a but professional quarterback. Career, yeah. He's a special quarterback. And Baker's going to learn a lot from him. And this is probably one of the first situations where you don't come into the season with a true quarterback controversy. I know the outside is saying, you know, can Baker win the job, but it's not as if he's unseating a guy that is, you know, up for grabs. Tyrod's had tremendous success in the last few years. Well, I mean, he so got the Bills to the playoffs. Gonna do yeah. it. Excuse me? That's it. He got the Bills to the playoffs. That's a pretty big deal. <laughs> he, he got the Bills. It, that is a huge deal. So Ty, Tyrod, for me, he's going to be the guy that stabilizes the franchise and gives Baker a chance just to learn what it means to be an NFL quarterback, how do you prepare, how do you present yourself, just what this whole game is about. And I think he's going to help slow the game down for Baker. So whenever he takes the reins, which I anticipate probably next year, um, hopefully you know it's a smooth transition and it works out the best for both of them. Uh, but then you look at the, the piece of that receiver, I think Josh Gordon is going to come back and be the Josh Gordon that he was when he led the NFL in receiving. Oh, yeah. You know what you're getting out of Jarvis Landry. He's a Pro Bowl type player who is going to be a, a great safety valve and he's going to spring one loose every once in a while. They have Coleman on the outside, an athletic tight end you know, who came from Coach Rick's squad down in Miami. Uh, and then you have the two headed monster at running back, you have Chubb, who, you know, what he, he can do, and Carlos Hyde, who's an Ohio State guy. Uh, which should make the fans happy up there. And on, on defense, you know, I've seen clips of Denzel Ward. He, he looks like he can uh, be a huge asset at the corner position, even though he's a rookie. I think he has a very high ceiling. He's going to make a lot of good plays. And they've done a great job of building the team, not just getting random pieces that they think may fit in, but actually addressing true needs and strategically putting this thing together. For that reason, I think that 9-7 and seven, is realistic. Uh, I, I don't think that you know they're going to be the big bully of the, of the division, but I do think that they're going to be highly, highly competitive this year, uh, especially whenever Josh Gordon walks back into the building and, and they all gel together. That's. I, I wish you could see Chris's face right. Now. I mean, he's nodding to everything you were saying. I'm glowing right now, man. <laughs> and, and, and I know that I'm the homer because I've been saying this, but but I really truly believe it. Jarvis Landry came out and told everybody. We're going to score 40 a game. Look at this offense. Uh, I, I like moving Joe uh, Benina to, to the left tackle to take um, uh, Joe Thomas's place. And, and that guy was a wrecking ball at guard last year. I think he can do it. Um, so I like the line. I, I, I like everything about this team. And, and I do think they can be the bullies. That conference, that division doesn't scare me at all. They've been the bastard child for too long. They will not anymore. Tyrod Taylor is a professional <laughs> quarterback. I've been trying to tell people that. And also, if they he wins yeah, nine dude. games, Baker won't start next year. They'll build a statue to Tyrod. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, uh, Derek Anderson won, won, won ten games. That's and right. They, yeah. they ended up somewhat dismantling that team. So I, I don't think that they'll do that this time around. I, I do think that they'll just continue to ride the momentum, whatever that is. I'm I'm anticipating this is nine games, and once you stabilize the franchise, then you can start to get other guys to come in. Then you can start to get the buy-in. You're not going into the season as the stepchild. You're going into the season actually playing for something. And who who knows? We, we don't know what the Bengals are going to be. We don't know what the Ravens are going to be. They're they're calling for uh, Lamar Jackson to beat out Joe Flacco, and then RG three. He's from one small sample size, you know, he looked like he could potentially um, have found his way again. And their defense isn't, you know, the Ray Lewis, Ed Reed. You, you just never know. So I, I'm hoping that, uh, like you're <laughs> not hoping South Carolina sneaks up on Georgia. I hope that the Browns are able to sneak up on a lot of people early and just carry that momentum out throughout the rest of the season. All right, now we have kept you forever, so we uh, we do appreciate you hopping on. We're going to have to get you back on later on this season. That sound all right? 
Uh, for sure, for sure. Good luck to you guys, and uh, we'll see how all this plays out. Absolutely. Good he luck is to everything you're doing too, man. Former Thank Georgia you. and Cleveland Browns wide receiver Muhammad Masakwai. You can follow him on Twitter at Iron Masakwai. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you soon, all right? All right, you guys. Take it easy. All right, take care. All right, so we got John Lacombe from the West Lot Pirates on with us, the Northwestern Podcast. You can check him out on iTunes, uh, Facebook, Twitter, it, we're, it, everywhere. West Lot Pirates are everywhere. Yep. So go check him out. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about Urban Meyer today. So we'll give everybody a summary of what has happened to get us to this point. Uh, former Ohio State coach Zach Smith was arrested for a criminal trespass on his ex-wife's property just before Big Ten Media Days. That led Brett McMurphy, who is a former ESPN reporter but is currently working for himself. I think next week he starts a stadium, but he's just freelance right now. Uh, he starts digging around. He finds that Smith had a domestic assault arrest in 2009 for pushing his pregnant wife up against the wall uh, when he was a grad assistant under Meyer at Florida. McMurphy also found out that Smith had another domestic assault arrest and a restraining order put on him in 2015 by the same woman, Courtney Smith, his, uh, his now ex-wife. When the story broke... Urban confirmed that he knew about the 09 story and that he and his wife had counseled the, quote, young couple. But when asked about 2015, he said he didn't know anything about it. And he took a shot at, at Brett McMurphy with this. He said, I got a text late last night that something happened in 2015. There was nothing. I don't know who creates a story like that. Now, that pissed off Courtney Smith, who then talked to McMurphy and provided tons of text messages, etc., which led to Meyer being put on paid administrative leave. All right, John, let me get you to jump in here. Um, if Urban could have avoided all of this, right? Well, of course. But I think the problem is I think Urban Meyer is a fan of your podcast and he's a competitive guy. (laughs) And uh, I think Urban was listening after a while and he was like, wait a minute, winning cures everything? You guys better hold my beer. (laughs) I think you guys got to hold my beer. I like it. No, so I think, yeah, I mean, kind of like you said, right? It's, It's the... It's it's not just that he said it, it's the way that he said it, which is which puts that whole, you know, this apology that he's put up online uh, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, half apology, apology that he's put up online. Um, I think it's what kind of draws that into question. Right. Because it's not like he just stood up there and was like, I don't really know what you're talking about or I'm not at liberty to discuss that or whatever. He kind of, like you said, he took a shot at McMurphy. He was like, I don't know who makes up a story like that. I mean, he's really dismissive. And then someone, I don't know if it was McMurphy or who, um, you know, a couple hours later kind of doubled down on it. And it's like, you sure this is where you're going to go on all this? And Meyer was kind of like, that's that's where I am. You know, that's, that's what I'm saying. So um, I think it... He certainly dug himself a little bit of a mess. It does him no favors that Zach Smith uh, went on ESPN. Well, hold on, hold on. Let's let's go. Let me let me run through the rest oh, of it. Oh, sure, go ahead. I mean, and then yeah. and then we'll jump in. These guys so, are geniuses. So Ohio State assigns a six-person investigative committee to research the situation. Uh, now, in my opinion, it should have been done by an independent third party, but Ohio State assigns these people. It's Current Ohio State Board of Trustees members Alex Fisher, Janet Porter, and Alex Shoemate. They are joined by former Ohio uh, House Speaker Joanne Davidson, former Acting U.S. Deputy Attorney General Craig Morford, and Carter Stewart, who is a former U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio, all of which understand exactly how important football is to the economic fabric of the state of Ohio. Well, keep it now. Yeah. It, go ahead. I was going to say, keep in mind when you look at like something like former Ohio House Speaker Joanne Davidson, this whole like you can't go into anything on, with Ohio politics and not have it crisscross with Ohio State athletics. I mean, keep in mind right exactly. now you've got Jim Jordan, who's a congressman from the state of Ohio, who's got an eye on running for a Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives, is fighting off allegations uh, that he turned a blind eye to sexual assault when he was the assistant wrestling coach at Ohio State. So it's like, I mean, we'll get into this in a little bit, but none of this stuff is happening in a vacuum, and that's not good for Urban Meyer. No, not not at all. So we'll we'll fast forward a touch to Friday afternoon. Meyer releases a statement, like you were talking about, uh, basically saying he was ill-prepared to answer those questions at Big Ten Media Day and that he did know about the 2015 instance, and that he reported it to the proper channels, which 
to me, sounds like he's throwing his AD, Gene Smith, under the bus. Uh, but along with that, Zach Smith goes on 105.7 The Zone in Columbus, Ohio. He tells the show host that he never abused Courtney, nothing illegal or violent ever happened between them. Immediately after that, McMurphy tweets out a screenshot of a text from Zach to Courtney where he's apologizing for choking her on two separate occasions. Now, in my opinion, uh, Meyer thought, I think, uh, he thought putting out that statement was going to help calm the waters, but it just kind of engulfed everything all over again. He, Him saying that he knew the whole time, but that he reported it, like that immediately led the already pissed off people to start in on the fact that he let, uh, he let a person with two different domestic assault arrests stay on his staff for years. Like, I, it doesn't matter if charges are brought in that case because people understand the circumstances that a wife and mother, et cetera, can be in in that situation. So let's dig in here. I want thoughts on on what Meyer should have done if there was a way for him to get out of, of all of this mess, what Ohio State should have done with their committee, what Ohio State should do with Meyer, why did Meyer keep the kid? Cetera, like, let's just dig into everything. It, John, you can start first. I'm going to let Chris talk. I've got everything that I said out of the way. Y'all just dig in on this dude. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, I'm sure we're all big Urban Meyer fans, so I'm sure this is going to oh. be no, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Uh, no. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I mean, this was kind of said, like you said, he went on Ohio Sports Talk Radio, Zach Smith, and then he goes on ESPN. I mean, it, it does Meyer no favors that he, he goes on, he's, you know, half defending Meyer, like, oh, I think he could have done this, could have done this, which is the worst thing for Meyer ever, because Zach Smith comes across in these interviews almost like like an actor playing an abusive husband, like on TV, where you're almost like, that's a little, <laughs> you're a little too on the nose, you need to dial it down a little bit. We need <laughs> just, just a touch. We need something more subtle here. So I'm like, he's so, I mean, obviously it's a bad situation, but I mean, I, you know, and, and obviously we're all digging in and we're trying to, we're speculating a little bit, trying to figure all this stuff out, of course. Well, us, let, us and B. Let me, let me ask you this. Why would Zach Smith come out and say anything? Like he's not hired, right? Like he doesn't work for anybody. Well, I. Why even come out? I, I mean, I think part of it is, I think in his. I mean, listening to him on the ESPN thing, I think in his mind, he's digging himself out of a hole, whereas to everyone else, he's just digging himself deeper and deeper in. I think in his mind, he's got something where it's like, I mean, he must have said husband and wife issue. I don't know how many times on on ESPN. <laughs> this is just between me and my husband. It, it's like, yeah, the 1950s called. Like, you need to, you know, the, I mean, it's just like between me and my wife, it's like ridiculous. So, but I think, you know, looking, reading between the lines here, I think there is something where it's like Urban Meyer knows that, that his assistant coach and his wife are having all of these problems and, you know, and his wife, I'm sure, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if Urban Meyer's ever even going to bother making a formal denial, but obviously his wife is coming to him being like, I've been talking to Courtney Smith and this is a disaster. What are you going to do about this, et cetera? And that classic, that classic situation, right, where it's like, whether it's, I mean, coach college football or any job, it's a situation where like, oh, well, we don't want to, we don't want to take this guy's job away because that just hurts anybody. Well, you know what? There are clear channels to keep you from having to make that kind of decision. It's called Title IX, and everyone's bound to it that works at a college campus. And you don't have to make those decisions, Urban Meyer. You just kick it up to the proper channels. Now, like you said, he's saying that he did that. I don't know. Um, I will say this, and, and again, you guys can speak to his time at Florida better than me, better than anybody. But what I can tell you about his time in the Big Ten is that I mean, you. I mean, all you have to do is like, like you said. I mean, I. I think to most of the people on the outside, this Ohio State panel is looking like you know a lot of a lot of members of the home team are on this panel. Yes, right. Um, indeed. But I think within Ohio State, the pe- the powers that be are trying to outsource it as best they can because the thing is, I'll say this: um, the days of admi- an administration thinking that they can back a head coach in the Big Ten and not have it blow up in their face have been long over. I mean, we're I mean, we're well removed from Graham Spanier and Tim Curley both going to jail over the Penn State yeah. thing, right? And then you've got Michigan State where they cleaned house top to bottom. 
uh, because of the whole Larry Nasser thing. Um, you've got, and, and I mean, so those are the two big ones, right? But I mean, well, and, and now people can look at Michigan State and say, well, they didn't get Izzo and they didn't get D'Antonio. Sure. So like, and I mean, those guys were it, peripherally involved, I guess, at best. Exactly. It but, was very minimal. But what you've got right now, right, is, is you've got presidents and, athlete, presidents and athletic directors. The writing is on the wall, right? It's like your faith in this guy will not save you. Don't think that because, like, if the public starts to believe you could have done something to and you didn't do it, you're in big trouble. I mean, I've got, I, I mean, again, Big Ten country, I can just go through. I mean, you've got Ohio State, right? They fire, I, I was just laughing with somebody over this. You know, they fired Jim Tressel for Tattoo Gate, which now looks Correct. like the softest thing ever. Now I'm like, gosh, I wish we could go back to when guys were getting free tattoos. Um, that seems like that seems like the good old days. Um, and then you've got there at the AD, who was the AD when Tressel was fired, Gordon Gee. That guy could never keep his mouth shut. He finally basically gets pushed out the door in 2013. Um, like I said, you've got the same thing going on with this guy with Jim Jordan. So you've got a current sitting Ohio congressman where he's being pulled into a separate potential sexual assault scandal at Ohio State. You've got Mike Thomas, the AD at Illinois. He got canned in 2015 because of the whole Tim Beckman mess. You've got oh, yeah. um, you've got Rutgers. You've got their second to last AD uh, got fired because of everything that went on with the basketball coach Mike Rice. And then their most second most recent AD Julie Herman got fired for everything that went on with their football coach Kyle Flood. You've got Tracy Clay's got dumped. I mean Minnesota was an example, right? Of uh, oh yeah, you've got Tracy Clay's getting canned at Minnesota because after going nine and four, right after, right exactly after. <laughs> I mean, well, and he had you know along with Jerry Kill had built that program out of nothing. But yeah. by that point, the writing was starting to come on the wall in the conference. And the minute he said some things he shouldn't have said in the wake of their own sexual assault scandal, Minnesota was just like, and, and I think even by then, Minnesota's president and AD were like, the axes are coming for us next. It's not a situation. Well, the, so, it's not a situation again where everyone's like, "Well, you had to back the coach." It's like, no. If, if the minute we see, think it goes thing. above the, you, you're all gone. The coach is in a in a so Tracy Clay's was in a no win situation because if you don't back your players, right, like you lose the locker room, right, right. So, but if as soon as he backs his players and it has to do with sexual assault, then he has lost his administration. Well, so like he, there was no way for him to win. And then, well, and the other unfortunate thing for him is because the players took a stand, he took a hard stand, and then when, within hours, the EEOC report came out that basically was just like a hundred pages of detailing everything other than the names of exactly yeah. what happened, and then that was all gone. But I mean, you've got you've got two schools, right, just between Michigan State and Penn State within the last ten years, where it's been a total house cleaning. Right. I mean, you know, in the case of Penn State, firing was the least of it. Right. But you've yeah, got, people go to jail. But you've got the you've got the 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 president, the AD at Ohio State right now. The days of them being like, we've got to back Urban Meyer because he is the biggest thing since sliced bread at Ohio State. Those days are gone. They will cut him loose in a second if they think it's going to creep all the way up to their level. Um, and be well, you talked about Gordon Gee. And and remember, he came from Vanderbilt. So where he was before, he had never seen real football money. Right. Right. He had never seen what like what effect a big time football program can have on a school. So he worshipped Jim Tressel. Like he thought that was the biggest thing going. A at least with Gene Smith, like he understands. Uh, at least I would think that. Look, you got to get out ahead of this thing and. I, I would think that he and everybody else up there would understand. If you cut Urban Meyer loose, you can go get another good head coach. Right. Like, Ohio State has never fallen off for very long at all. They, I mean, it went from, from Woody to Jim Tressel to, uh, to Urban Meyer, basically. Like, you had the one year of Luke Fickle in there, but, right. like, now, that's it. Now, like I mean, they now, they right. always get good ones. Now, they're always going to get a good coach. Now, with that said, I mean, I don't want to sell Urban Meyer short. I mean, this is... I mean, like we, so we previewed, we're, we're in the middle of all of our Big Ten previews for the Westlot Pirates right now. We previewed. <laughs> Did Ohio you have to redo Ohio State's? 
Yeah, right. Well, we put, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing. They're l- lucky for lucky for them. We got that out of they they were they're in our non-con. I mean, our our no plays this year cuz we're up to okay. you know, 14 teams now. So we we previewed, previewed them early cuz we don't play them. And uh Northwestern. And yeah. so uh, we you know, I I do the defense every year and uh I mean, this is as close to SEC football as the Big Ten's ever going to get cuz I mean, Ohio State may have as many as fi- as four five-star cornerbacks not starting this year. So Ooh. even for Ohio State, Urban's taken them to a place relative to recruiting that very few teams in the Big Ten have been in recent history. And so, I mean, it's, it's, they will, they'll feel it. And I mean, again, we've been going through the, you know, the whole Big Ten West and you've got Penn State, Michigan State, especially Michigan. Everyone's got big question marks and Ohio State has question marks at quarterback, but that team's absolutely stacked everywhere else. And it was kind of like they were the beacon of stability in the conference. And now it's kind of like, I don't think so. Um, and of course, the real funny thing is, I've mentioned how many schools, how many names, how many ridiculous situations, and somehow Jim Harbaugh's name has stayed out of all of it. I have, n- <laughs> I have no idea how that's even possible. Listen now, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Jim is crazy, but he's not like he's not he's not this way. But, I mean, he's just nuts, oh, and I'm okay with nuts. Oh. I like quirky. Okay, I like weird. Well, Jim, but I. But I can't handle Urban, and I've hated him before he got to Florida. When he got to Florida, his whole time here, um, I just don't. I don't understand where this guy gets off. And then for some reason, he's a really handsome dude. He looks great on the sidelines. He is unbelievable in front of a camera. And because of that, America has given him a pass. This guy is a grade A piece of trash, and I've been screaming it to anybody who will listen for years there is no doubt in my mind that these coaches know what these players are getting into now they don't stalk them they don't follow them around they don't know their every move but he had not a guy that got in a little trouble which every university has well hold on you talked about you're saying players but like this was an assistant coach no we're having let me get there okay (laughs) we're talking about this man had a hard core gang member that committed oh. multiple <laughs> murders while at Florida on his team. Now, did he know about the murders? Sweet Lord, I hope not. But I don't know that his integrity is strong enough to where if he did, but Aaron Hernandez is that good of a player and wins a national championship with them, that he wouldn't sweep that under the rug or call into effect local police departments to kind of look in the other direction and leave his guy alone. This guy is 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 a is a whole different level piece of trash and somehow he has gotten a pass from everybody all the way through our country and I don't understand it. And I always felt like is there something wrong with me? Am I judging him too harshly because I despise him? I don't think he has any character at all. I don't think he has any integrity at all. Is he good at coaching football? Sure. Outside of coaching football, the guy probably could barely be a PE teacher. I mean, look at the moves he's making to defend himself. These guys are idiots. Well, and they're just really good at football. Well, and you look at the way he talks about the 2009 incident, right? Like, it just like it's like someone should just sit him down and be like, "This is 2018, like young couple." He's like, "Oh, yeah. this isn't like some young lovers quarrel." The guys had something like what, like nine reports or something like that. Like they're like, yeah, they're it's, like the, it's up there, right? And it's like the guy, and he's like, "Oh, it was like a young couple, so we got him counseling." It's like uh, this isn't like a marriage spat. It's like this is an abusive relationship, and right, and I think, and and right, of course, the whole thing he's trying to dance around now with this apology is, is if you knew about twenty fifteen. Okay, maybe you filed the proper channels, but first of all, like we said, you've got an AD, Gene Smith, who will cut bait in a second if he thinks you're trying to sell him out. And they'll go straight to the emails. They're going to want to say, is there an email record of this? Show us the email where you told Gene Smith about this in 2015. Because if you didn't and that email's not there, you're in compliance and there's no way Gene Smith's ever going to be like, yeah, Urban talked to me about this, even if that did happen. If there's not a paper trail, uh, it ends with you. And the second thing is, even if he did that, everyone's immediately going to be like, if you knew about 20, 2009 and you knew about 2015, what the heck was this guy doing coaching your team for another three years? 
And but that's the and, question, right? Like, let me let me get both of y'all to answer that. Tell me, uh, other than him being Earl Bruce's grandson, why would Meyer keep this kid on staff? Like, he, there's 200 wide receivers coaches in America that could do his job. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, Kerry. I get. I just. I, yeah. I think Urban thinks he's bigger than the. He doesn't have to answer to anybody. These guys feel like they're gods because we make them gods. And I just, I just think like this guy, again, I said it before, but I think, you know, it became clear from all those Courtney Smith text messages, right, that this is one big family, right? All these wives are talking together, which means all the wives are talking to the husbands, which means it's all going around in circles. And I think that means that Urban was probably sitting there in 2015 or something. I mean, it could be. I mean, I'm giving him a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt than Chris is. But again, it might just be like Urban's just like, I flat don't care. The guy can coach. But like maybe Urban was sitting there being like, oh, well, golly gee, I just don't know what to do. Um, obviously, this is a really bad situation, but I don't want to hurt Courtney Smith by firing him. But again, like I said, that's why all of these Title IX and everything else is in place. So that someone like a football coach isn't making these decisions. You're supposed to Correct. kick it up the ladder. And then someone whose job it is to make these decisions just says, "Yeah, you got to fire this guy." And then you're like, "Sorry, it's, it's out of my hands." Title Nine stuff. It, let me let me get on this Title Nine stuff. Title Nine is the most confusing oh, crap. Like yeah. universities should not be in the business of trying to to dig into these things. They should not be investigating this. It should be police and whatnot. Local right? police department. Well, and so hang on. So this is another route that I take, and and I don't know this. And, and, and I don't know the police officers there, but I know small town cops and I know schools that have immense power and influence. OK, this guy's a football coach. If she does call the police, how much of this stuff gets kind of swept under the rug? And, hey, why don't you go sleep at your sister's tonight? And he cools down and then tomorrow y'all talk and everything's OK. And that's kind of how the police handle it. I'm not saying that. But would it surprise me if that happened? No, not at all. Which is why him wearing that uniform, him standing on that sideline saying, I am an employee of the Ohio State football team, carries so much weight, he cannot have that luxury to protect himself. And while you keep him employed, he's always going to have that luxury of saying, hey, don't mess with me. I work for Ohio State football. Well, and again, too, like, I mean, if you go back to the Penn State thing, right, and how it all came down on Paterno, because Paterno will say, hey, I kicked it up the ladder and I went on. But a lot of people would have said in that situation, right, a lot of people said, even even back then, they'd be like, kicked it up the ladder, how come you didn't call the cops? How come you yep. didn't find out about it, run and dial the police, and then... You know, again, it's literally the job of the police to do this. So you got a little bit right. I mean, if you call the cops and the cops don't do anything, you know, I'm inclined to give the coaching staff a little bit of a pass to be like, look, it's documented you called the police. And if the police didn't do it, I mean, you, then you're going to be arresting some cops. But it's like. But if Urban calls the cops, the cops are going to do anything Urban tells them. Anything. I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, he's. But again, it's he should just. I mean, and again, should call the cops, wash his hands of it. And again, it's. Again, it's 2018, and it's like when <laughs> separate from everything he does right here, did he follow the proper channels? A bunch of things. You're gonna have a huge section of the pop of the, of the populace that's just gonna be like, I don't want to care about. I don't care about whether or not you told Gene Smith. How come the minute you didn't find out one of your employees was beating his wife, you didn't just call the cops and then like deal with this situation? So I don't know. I mean, again, I think. For a split second, Urban thought he did himself a, a, a solid when he released that statement. And then between the Zach Smith interviews and everything else, that has evaporated really quickly. So I think the real question is this, this quote-unquote independent panel, what is their timetable and, uh, and how are they going to try to work about this? Because I would imagine behind closed doors, the first thing I would do is I'd go to Gene Smith and I'd be like, let's see the emails. Let's see the emails where he told you this. Is it your problem or is it his problem? And uh, I don't, I mean, I kind of, at this point, I'm like, if he did, and then it's in Gene Smith's lap, you know, it's it's kind of like someone's going to get fired. And I, I kind of have a hard time seeing that it's Gene Smith unless these emails pop up. My, well, see, my problem is this. So I, I'm actually friends with a lot of my connections in Cleveland. I know a ton of Ohio State people. And there is a 
mass following right now that is like getting together supporting urban in this and that's something that really bothers me i can i can tell you with all honesty les miles so many lsu fans thought he had to go because he couldn't win ball games that he should have won consistently and the offense wasn't what it was and it was all football related and i was the one guy saying i want my coach he cares more about these guys being good men than he does about being great football players, and that matters to me. It is some, Now, I'm in the minority of fanatic football fans, but that matters to me. I cannot imagine, and it helps that I hate Ohio State, and it helps that I hate Urban Meyer, but I cannot imagine defending a football coach with something that I find of a line of principle, something that I find that this is not negotiable, that this is not something that I can just overlook or overpass by and say, well, once season starts, I won't worry about this anymore. I'm not saying that I'm better than all of those other people, but I have no idea how any of them are able to line up in the streets, gather together and say, we stand with Urban. He's our guy. We don't want him gone. There has to be something else that happened. And it's all strictly because they know the college football com- is so competitive when they lose urban the time it takes to go from urban to the next coach could be a national championship season slip through their fingers and that disgusts me yeah it's i i I mean i completely agree and i think it's funny like you said with meyer and this image and everything i mean i think tebow's part of it right i think this how does he get credit for tebow being one of the greatest people on the planet but that's what i mean like right it gets it gets pulled in like this set of values and keep in mind you know i mean that's he's he's tebow's not the best quarterback during the uh the best florida quarterback of the urban meyer era that would be cam newton who was there for about two seconds until he stole some laptops (laughs) and then got kicked kicked out and that one and kind of as as you pointed out earlier that one's kind of far down the list in terms of things guys who were at florida uh while i mean you you had chris rainey like uh telling a girl like time to die b right like all all kind of different stuff out there i mean florida was a train wreck right and and you know i think and and again i don't i don't want to wade into conspiracy theories and all that but i mean i was when meyer suddenly resigned i was kind of like you know i was looking to see is there more there there kind of thing and maybe it wasn't it may may have just been his health reasons he wanted the year off and everything like that but, nah, he was <laughs> he was scared of saving but that's all that was come on man <laughs> oh now look what you did now see <laughs> we got we got alabama in the show See, it took it took like two hours for us to get it. But yeah, we had it had Alabama on the show. Yeah. It, uh, we had Muhammad Masakwai on earlier. I wanted to ask him if he still had nightmares about the uh, about the blackout game down <laughs> at Georgia. <laughs> oh goodness! Anyway, uh, all right. So so let's wrap this all up in a nice little bow. Uh, what could Meyer have done to prevent this, other than like firing him back in 2015 when he found out about it? And and what happens now? Like, uh, what what are we going to find out this week? I, I mean, I don't know what we're going to find out new, but I've got to think, like I said, it's chain of command, right? And again, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Plenty of ADs and and not a small amount of university presidents have been fired in the Big Ten behind some of this stuff. And um, they're going to go to the emails and if, you know, and G, someone like Gene Smith's only going to be too happy to be like, I don't have the emails. This doesn't fall in my lap. I don't care what Urban said in his statement. None of this arrived at me. So it's either on paper or it's not on paper. But I feel like if it's on paper, Gene Smith's going to be the one who's going to be in the line of fire. And if it's not on paper, I just don't see how Urban gets out of this. I think for a second he thought he'd gotten himself some wiggle room, but but I don't know. I mean, it's stunning because a week ago this wasn't on anybody's radar and just bang. It's come right up. and um, Now, do you, you don't think there's any way on earth if we get into a he said, she said, and Urban digs his heels in and says, I told him, and he says, I didn't. You know everybody in the country, and definitely everybody in Ohio State's going to believe Urban. I guess, but, I mean, again, uh, if you've got an AD and a school president that think they're going to get fired, 
they will cut bait. Like I said, I mean, this is it, it's a different world than it was 10 years ago. These guys do not ride or die for their college football coaches the way that they used to. Not if they think it's going to come all the way up to their job. So, I, again, I you know, we'll see. But I, I've got to think this independent panel or whatever, they're looking at some emails right now and they're seeing what's there. And I think that's going to be the next shoe to drop one way or the other. I like it. It's 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 really sad. I mean, we 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 laugh and we joke because Urban and these guys just bumble this situation so badly, but it's not funny. This chick was terrorized her you know entire marriage oh, for a for long sure. time by this psychopath, and and it was allowed to happen. Well, none of this comes out if he doesn't get arrested for criminal trespass. It wasn't even the domestic assault stuff that popped up. Like that no. stuff got brought out because of the trespass. Right. Like. Had none of that stuff, like, had he not gone on her property like he was told not to do, like, none of this would have happened. And, and Urban calling, you know, in essence, uh, you know, the the writer that come out and, 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 and reports all this, pretty much fabrication. Oh, he just made this whole story up. What makes people do that? Yeah, if you, right. if you don't call out Brett McMurphy, yeah. you're probably all right. Yeah, you're probably all right. But you literally just called this guy a liar and said he made all this up and... Now look what happens. Well, it's you know it's, it's funny on our pod we've talked about it too. Where um, you know when Me Too blew up over the past two years, right? We were like, if there's any place this is going to get to, it's going to be college sports, especially oh, yeah. college football. And oh, yeah. uh, because these guys have just been so clearly poor at, at handling everything, and you've got you know, and again, it's like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. It was a heck of a lot of different environment for a college football coach to be like, I just didn't know what my assistant coach was doing, and I heard one thing, and I heard another, and I just wasn't sure who to believe, so I just kind of had to keep on doing my job. And now, now today, like, none of that flies. No, now, that now it's like, oh, that's if that's if that's what you're going to say, then we'll just fire you because that's not, like, none of that's going to, none of that plays anymore. And I think, again, it's... I doubt this is the first or the last time this kind of thing is going to come up, but uh, it's there. It's it's arriving at college football, and uh, I, I'm sure Meyer's not going to be the first or the last guy. How do you think it affects their season? Give me a win total. Oh boy, I mean, I I think you know their ceiling's 14, so uh, that's where that's where it was. I mean, they've got as clear of a path. We were talking about this. I mean, you've got Michigan. I mean, first of all, I mean. This, well, again, the ceiling would be fifteen, wouldn't it? Fifteen, right? I mean, the yeah. amount and the amount of uh, <laughs> yeah, fifteen. It's yeah, that's all. All the rules, man. The I know the. It's uh, ridiculous. I mean, the amount of good defenses in this conference is crazy. But you've got, um, I mean, you know, we could go down a whole, a whole other corrupt coach coach road if we start talking about Shea Patterson. But Shea Patterson's at Michigan now, and uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's like if he's the answer for them, maybe that unlocks their potential. Michigan State, they had an amazing run defense, good overall defense, and good quarterback play last year. The play calling was kind of a little bit up in the air. Um, and then, so you've got, and you got Wisconsin, right? Like the talent level's not there, but the defense is unbelievable, et cetera, et cetera. But you keep pre- we keep previewing all these teams, right? And it just keeps coming back to Ohio State. It's Ohio State that everyone else has to knock off. It's like, oh, well, if everything comes together for Team X and they get this kind of quarterback play and this kind of defensive play, maybe they can go at Ohio State. Or if Penn State's defense makes, you know, an even bigger leap this year and they're able to make up for Saquon Barkley and Trace McSorley is is off the charts maybe they make a run at Ohio State but it's Ohio State by a good margin still even with a new quarterback coming in I mean they are just heads and tails above everyone else from a talent and recruiting standpoint so but now the question is you know what does this do to all that I mean it could be that at least in the short term um, you know, they're still able to work with, with everything that they've got. But I do think, you know, and even, even Urban seems to realize this, the whole idea of a distraction and everything. I mean, they don't want him around the program right now. They know that all the pieces are pretty well in place, at least for this season. They want to let things run. So I don't know. I will say, you know, you've got Harbaugh, call him crazy, call him whatever. He couldn't wait to jump on this. Um, you know, he's, oh, tw- yeah. he's tweeting out uh, whatever uh, – those those who first practice to deceive oh what a tangled web we weave like he had that 
It's like he had that ready to go on Twitter the minute oh, yeah. the Urban Meyer stuff came down, and it's kind of like, all right, Jim, well, but come Urban on. is taking shots at him, right? And 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 so you know, you you had to expect it, yeah, right, it, right, so. exactly. So I mean, that's that Ohio State Michigan thing, and that goes back to everything you're saying about before, right? I mean, there's this whole element above all of this, right, where everyone's like. Well, so does Michigan have a chance now? How yeah. does this affect Ohio State, Michigan? So, yeah, if you're looking for classy, look somewhere else because uh, <laughs> you're you're in the Big Ten West and it's Ohio State versus Michigan. Uh, good gracious! All right, he thank is you John. For jumping on. Yeah, thank you for jumping yeah, on. He is John Lacombe from the Westlot Pirates. You can follow them on Twitter at Westlot Pirates. They're on Facebook. They're on. Uh, what is it? Westlotpirates.com? Is that yeah, the website? That's it. Westlotpirates.com. And and uh, once yeah, if you want if you want to check us out, if you're obviously I know you're you're SEC country, but uh, if any of y'all are curious about what's going on in the Big Ten, uh, we're in the middle of all of our Big Ten previews right now. So you want to look at least on the football field, what's going on with the Buckeyes or what's going on with the Wolverines or anybody else? It's all up there right now. So check it out. Absolutely wonderful. All right, buddy, we're gonna get you back on during the season. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. We'll talk soon. All right, so Conor McGregor is officially back. Now, I'm giving this its own segment. It's not going to be a long one, but here's the deal. UFC 229 on October 6th, Conor McGregor versus Habib Nurmagomedov in Las Vegas for the lightweight title. The fight was announced at the UFC 25th anniversary press conference on Friday. Did you see it? No. Okay, so it was immediately after Nate Diaz's return against Dustin Poirier was announced on or for November 3rd at Madison Square Garden as a non-headline fight. Diaz was late for the press conference. He didn't say much. During the promo video announcing McGregor and Habib, he storms off the stage and he leaves the event. He tweeted, I'm not fighting on that show, F the UFC. And then people interviewed him outside, and he told them that the UFC better start treating him right, they better start promoting him right. He said that they even picked him up late for the press conference. So, does Diaz have a point here? I mean, yeah, he's definitely getting pushed to the back burner over McGregor. So, I mean, I, could, a, I now, could see where that would get under somebody's crawl. They've got him ranked as the number 10 uh, guy in his division. And he's at the 170-pound division, yeah. which, whatever that's called now. Um, but it, I think that he, I think he's got a very good point because he made them a lot of money. And he told them the only way that he was coming back was if he got McGregor 3. Yeah, because they're one and one, and then they th- and he thinks that he won that last one. Yeah, but either way, he was coming back because he wants to finish this up with McGregor. Well, they told him McGregor's not coming back. You know, we need you to do this, and then they announce the McGregor fight right after they announce him coming back. So McGregor completely overshadows Diaz's return, which I think they did on purpose. I would imagine that was done on purpose. So back to McGregor. We talked about this back in February. How many casual UFC fans knew who in the world Habib was before McGregor threw that dolly at the bus inside Barclays? I don't know that many of them know who he is today. And that's the thing. They made him such a a bigger name, like on ESPN, on everywhere else, because of what happened with McGregor getting arrested and coming after him because of what he did to Artem and, and everything else. So Dana White back then called it the most disgusting act in the history of the UFC. Now, do you remember what I said? No. It was a stunt that went overboard because they had to find a way to hype up Habib and make his name known to the casual fans. That way, McGregor would have a fight that was actually worth coming back for. Now, Dana White, calling or he's calling this fight the biggest MMA fight in history, and they are using clips from that, quote, disgusting incident as promo for the actual fight. With Diaz and McGregor back fighting, do you think of the UFC is officially back now? I don't know that it's officially back. Those fights will be good, and when those guys are not fighting, it will be back to what it's always been. This is the problem. It's a star-driven sport. When the stars aren't fighting, it's not as good. When the stars are, it's great. Yeah, I agree. Um, The only way that we don't get Diaz-McGregor 3, so if, if McGregor wins and Diaz loses, we don't get it. If Diaz wins and McGregor wins, we'll probably get it. If they both lose, we'll probably get it. If McGregor loses and Diaz wins, we're going to get it. So, like... Diaz has to win, we get it. Yeah. Diaz wins, we get the fight. Yeah. So, for those that 
Bless you, buddy. For those that, that aren't watching on YouTube, we have a, a special guest on the podcast. My uh, my three-month-old is now in here. So, uh, but we're going to close out on that. I, I'm looking forward to watching McGregor fight again. Uh, I think this will be a good fight. I, Habib is the betting favorite right now. And he probably should be. Yeah, he's, he's minus 130, if okay. I'm not mistaken. I mean, this guy knocks folks out. You got that right. Well, and, he, and he, he knows how to grapple. I mean, yeah. he, he gets on the ground, man. So this this ought to be fun, and I, I can't wait for Diaz's return if he's actually going to fight because God knows what's going to happen with that because he, I mean, he's straight up said, like, I'm not fighting anymore. Yep. Like, forget that. So so we'll see what happens. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, – if nothing else, it was a lot of interesting talk about UFC. Oh, and then, of course, uh, on Saturday night, I watched uh, TJ Dillashaw absolutely destroy Car- uh, Cody Garbrandt, and I don't think anybody really cares. I didn't know there was a UFC fight. It was a great fight, but I don't think that many people care, and that's the problem. That's right? the problem. So, so hopefully McGregor coming back, Diaz coming back, that will uh, that will give people something to talk about in this sport, especially now that ESPN has uh, has signed on. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Time for the blurbs. Let's jump in. We're gonna try and make these quick because we had a lot on this podcast. Uh, NFL football is back. Did you watch the uh, did you watch the whole uh, nope. pff, Hall of Fame game? Not not one second. You didn't watch one second of the nah. Hall of Fame game? No, I went out, man. Where did you Where did you go out? Don't, I don't worry about where I went out. I yeah, went I, out. Where did you go out that they didn't have the game on? I I went to Texas State Brazil. They didn't have the game on. You didn't Texas invite State me Brazil. to Texas State Brazil, man? No, sir. I am hurt. No, sir. I am upset. That was a special special thing. <laughs> Very special meeting. All right, I understand. Everybody finally got to see Lamar Jackson, the quarterback. He was 4 out of 10 for 33 yards with a touchdown and a pick. Eight rushes for 25 yards. It wasn't the best first impression. Uh, Robert Griffin the third. I know you didn't watch, but he was pretty fantastic. Uh, I think they will probably keep him as the backup for this season, partly to help mentor Lamar Jackson. How, how do you feel about that? I think nothing that happened in the Hall of Fame game is relevant at all. Okay. They will play four more preseason games, and when it's all said and done, RG3 probably won't have a job with the Ravens. Okay, okay. I can get with that. Uh, Next up, Jim Harbaugh does not eat chicken. Have you seen this? I have seen this. This He's my guy. Former Michigan and current UCLA quarterback Wilton Spate revealed that Harbaugh told him not to eat chicken because, quote, it's a nervous bird. So Spate said he thinks some types of sickness – uh, or some type of sickness injected its way into the human population when people began eating white meats instead of beef and pork, which is funny because pork is a white meat. <laughs> pork is not a white meat. That's, That's absolutely not true. What? It, it's absolutely not true. Pork is not a white meat. The pork that you get in the grocery store that is white, you're talking to a barbecue master. Okay. That, that, that you get in the grocery store is white, has been so bred out, but it is absolutely a red meat. If you get a pure Duroc pork, but it's all red. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll roll with that. So Spade said, uh, Spade said that Harbaugh believes this 100%. What are your thoughts on this? I love it. I like the concept. Um, I love my – you know this. I love Les Miles. I love Steve Spurrier. I love Mike Leach. I love weird, quirky guys that are totally comfortable in their own skin. Harbaugh is that. It makes sense. I'm in. <laughs> I'm not a, hard to sell. A, a chicken is a nervous bird. You need to be eating cows and everything right. else that Eat will stand up for themselves. Like, by God. <laughs> Donald Trump called LeBron James dumb on Twitter, and people lost their minds. So the tweet says, LeBron James was just interviewed by the dumbest man on television, Don Lemon. He made LeBron look smart, which isn't easy to do. I like Mike. That was the tweet. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can't go on any type of media whatsoever and tell a guy who literally just started this school and doing the things that LeBron James is doing, regardless of what you think of him basketball-wise, and call him dumb and not get completely blasted. Now, Melania did come out and, and praised him afterwards, which is good on her. Uh, I don't think that the president should be in the business the, the of... voice of reason. Yeah, the, the president should not be in the business of Twitter wars with, with athletes or any celebrities. Any celebrities. 
I all agree. Of this. He now, I do. I, I will say this. LeBron has talked trash about Donald Trump for two years. That's but you don't get but to run for president and not be criticized. I com- I'm with you 100. percent I'm. It, it is strange times that we are living in. No, it's, very it's, strange it's, it's times. Ridiculous. If this was just celebrity against celebrity, yes, then that's one thing. Before he sat in that house on Pennsylvania Avenue, we're having a completely yeah. different conversation. Trump needs to realize that once you were in that chair, yep. you have to be bigger than this. So doing that was Le- just LeBron James that might be one of the classiest best individuals walking the planet right now. Yeah. And and if you're going to blast him after what he has been doing, dude, you're you're just you're going to come out on the wrong side of that in history. Yeah, I agree. Uh, DJ Jeffries decommitted from Kentucky this week. Local story. Yep, local story. Uh, DJ Jeffries plays at Olive Branch High School, or played at Olive Branch High School. He still plays. He's a junior. Is he's that a senior right? this year? Yeah. Oh, you're he's right. Not, oh, he's yeah, he'll still be now. He's, yeah, yeah, he's I'm a, sorry. He's a you're right. Uh, look, he plays for Penny's. Uh, well, used to be Penny's uh, AU, AU team. team. Correct. But Memphis fans need to kind of pump the brakes on this Penny versus Cal rivalry a little bit. Like getting Jeffries, who who actually played for Penny's AAU team, doesn't really make this a rivalry, in my opinion. He's Am gotta, I wrong? He, no, yeah, he's got to go into an out of state situation for both of them, head to head with a kid that has no connection to either one of them. And and if he wins one of those, yeah, like if yeah. he brings and, and Matthew DJ Hurt, Jeffries, DJ Jeffries has re- like family relations. I'm a, I, I got a little bit of insight, not a lot, just enough to like say some stuff. Sound like I'm intelligent. <laughs> Enough but, to talk trash. But there's a <laughs> really good chance it's all wrong. Um, I, I've got a little bit of inside information from some friends that are actually close to DJ Jeffries and all these AAU guys from Memphis. Um, and so originally I was the one guy saying, this guy's going to stay with Cal. He's not leaving because he, I, I heard all the stories about how hard Cal works to take care of him and, 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 and make him feel special and, and be around. But – it seemed like all his buddies that he plays AAU ball with have just been owning so much to where. If you go look at his Instagram, that's it. That's where it's all like, happening at yeah. too. If you that's go look at his Instagram, you can see at. like Alex Lomax, all these other guys all these that are going guys. to Memphis are all over him about go Tigers. And it, and and it used to else. be him shutting them down, him ignoring them, and now it became slowly him responding. Him laughing and now decommitment and and then we'll see just, what happens. We're all just assuming he's going to be committed to, to to Penny. Probably, probably so. All pretty, right, pretty fun around here. Blurb number four: Jalen Hurts spoke out at Alabama's media day on Saturday, saying he is not leaving because he graduates in December, but showed he's not really happy with how the coaching staff handled the quarterback competition between him and Tua. This is the quote: "All right, coaches can't control this situation." They dictate who plays, but as far as the other variations to it, they don't control it, honestly. Like I said, this whole spring, ever since the game, national championship game, they kind of wanted to let it play out and I guess didn't think it was a thing to let it die down like there wasn't something there. But that's always been the elephant in the room. For me, no one came up to me the whole spring, coaches included. No one asked me how I felt. No one asked me what was on my mind. No one asked me how I felt about the things that were going on. Nobody asked me what my future held. That's that. So now it's like when we try to handle the situation now, for me, it's kind of late. It's too late. The narrative has already been created. Let me get your thoughts on this, and then I'm going to jump in. So this is my problem with Nick. He came out, and oh, I I talked to to Hertz, and he's totally bought in, and he's not leaving, and he's going to be a part of this team. And that was the story Nick pushed out a couple of weeks back. Well, that and, was it, it. Was just last week. Yeah, whenever. Yeah, yeah. And, and so two weeks ago, he was saying the reason that Jalen had the problem initially is because Nick Saban came out and said, "Well, I don't know if he's going to be here for the Louisville game." But Jalen had told him in June, "Like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere." But it, to to defend Saban, he also had a quarterback two years ago in Blake Barnett that was committed to the program, said he was going to be there, and then left in the middle of September when Jalen Hurts got the job. But that guy, <laughs> Nick knew exactly what was going on. He knew that they hadn't talked to, Jay, uh, to, to Jalen. He knew that Jalen's gone as soon as he graduates, absolutely, and, and that's that. What Nick was doing is extremely deceitful and p- 
painted Jalen into a corner to where if he's anything but professional and and I'm going to support Tua and and we're one unit in the quarterback room, then Jalen's the problem. And that's exactly what Nick did a couple of weeks ago at Media Day. And Jalen's saying, hey, 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 let, I'm not going to be a problem, but, but I'm also not happy either. Let's not make it sound like we're all BFFs and I'm grooming this young boy. Like, like I want the starting job. I took us to two national championships back-to-back, think I've earned it, and now I'm having to compete with a guy that played two quarters of football that nobody had tape on, nobody was prepared for, and it was real easy to hit him with shock and all. Okay. I'm going to tell you this. I think what Nick did is one of the reasons why people outside of Alabama hate Nick. It's not because they beat him up all the time. He takes these players and he paints them into corners to where they look like assholes all the time, and I don't like that. He is a grown man, and he controls the narrative, and if you step out of line, you're wrong, and I just don't like it. Tell me, tell me about this. Uh, the, the quote about no one came up to me the whole spring, coaches included. No one asked me how I felt. No one asked me what was on my mind. No one asked me how I felt about the things that were going on. Nobody asked me what my future held. Nobody asked it's, him what his future held. This isn't it, just but, about his feelings. Nobody came up and talked to him at all, which means they have totally moved on from him being the quarterback. But, it, no, I don't buy that at all. I, I think it is still a competition. Here's the deal. Tua was out the entire spring with a broken bone in his throwing hand. Why and would that was, nobody be talking to him then? Because at that point, he had the opportunity to go out and not have to compete at all, just go and play. Why would you have to talk to him about how he feels about the situation? I don't he think signed a scholarship agreement. There's nothing to talk about. I don't think they're talking to him at all. I think he's given you examples of things that he wanted to talk about, but I don't think any communication was between him and any of the coaches. And see, and that's I, I would love that's to have problem. asked him more is, questions. Is, 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 you know as good as I do – if there's any type of communication whatsoever and there's something on your mind, then you have an opportunity to get that information out there to tell them. But if there's no communication at all, I believe they are treating him like one of these players that are hurt. And once you're, once you're on the training table, you're not on the practice squad, you're, you're dead to us. I don't think anybody's talking to him at all. I think uh, they have you, you might be moved right. on. And, and, and this is – this is the problem that people have with this sport. This is my problem with the transfer rules and all this other stuff is you as a coaching staff can completely ruin an entire year of eligibility for this young man strictly because you're done with him, you've moved on to the next thing, you don't want to compete against him, so you're just going to back him into a corner and say, you sit over here for a year, and then you can go somewhere next year after you graduate, but then you've got one year to do something, and that's it. That's my problem. Now, I mean, you you have said before, football is the ultimate meritocracy. So, if Jalen Hurts is the best quarterback, he will be the starter. I have no doubt about that. I don't know that. I think they've already moved on. And And the reason I say that is because I think these guys are so different in the way they quarterback. Nick knows that you can't put together two completely different game plans. You can't put together two completely different offenses and hope that if this guy wins out, then we'll run this offense. And if this guy wins out, we'll run this one. You can't prepare that way. Yeah. There's no way. And you can't put together an offense for Jalen and throw Tua into it. It worked in a national championship when you had a team that had no film on a kid, weren't prepared, weren't expecting that at all. That was an ultimate kamikaze move. We're going to lose this game if we don't do something drastic. They did something drastic, and it worked out. Do you do you think that they will both play against Louisville? No. You don't think so? No. I think both will play the, against Louisville. The only way they both play against Louisville is flat out, we're, we're making sure Jalen plays four games because we want that red shirt off him because that way if he chooses to go in conference in the SEC, then we don't have to worry about playing against him but for one year. I don't know about that. I, I, I think I think they both get think, to play. If you think Nick Saban isn't above that, you're wrong. You're just wrong. That guy's. We've not above talked about anything. that on this podcast about whether or not he would do that. Burn that. Burn it. He's gonna burn it. There's no doubt in my mind. He's gonna make sure Jalen leaves Alabama in December and only has one year. year eligibility. I could see it. I could definitely see it. I don't know. There, there's a lot to. Uh, 
still a whole lot to figure out in fall camps. Fall camps just opened up. So we'll see what happens. The only but, uh, way Jalen plays is if Tua's injury is more serious than we think. That's it. We are uh, – I got to tell you, we're not used to seeing this coming out of Alabama football players. It is uh, It is very interesting. I think that's why I grabbed a lot of headlines. So yeah. you, you don't normally have somebody going against the status quo. <sighs> All right. We're, uh, we're going to move off of that. Uh, you know what? I think – we're just going to wrap it up. Wrap it up. We're wrapping it's it up. All great right, you, show. You guys know what to do. Go check out the podcast, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play. You're already listening to it. Or you're watching us on YouTube, one or the other. But uh, YouTube.com slash Winning Cures Everything. Uh, iTunes.com. Slash, uh, well, maybe we don't have one of those. Right. I don't know. Leave us a review on iTunes. Yep. Five stars. Leave us a written review. Uh, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, or Google uh, Podcasts now. All that wonderful stuff. So go check those out. WinningCuresEverything.com is the site. MyBookie.ag, the best online sports book out there. Promo code is WCE50. Go check that thing out. It's a 50% deposit bonus, which means basically you put in 100 bucks, they're going to give you 50. You put in 50 bucks, they're going to give you 25, et cetera, et cetera. Goes on from there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini. Or you can follow both of us combined at Winning Cures. You can also get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Winning Cures Everything. That's going to do it. So we will be back next week with Big Ten previews and Memphis predictions and uh, and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, we want to thank Muhammad Masakwai for being on the show. We want to thank John Lacombe from the Westlake Pirates for being on. It was a long one, but a good one. Thank you, guys. Later. We'll see you next week. It's time for the rundown. Remember, check out winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at Winning Cures. You can follow myself, at Gary WCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, that's winningcureseverything at gmail.com. And we now have a voicemail line. That number is 551 226 Nine eight nine nine. If you want to call and bash us for talking bad about your favorite team, or praise us, or just tell us about how awesome your team is doing, leave us a voicemail. That number again is 551-226-9899, and we may toss it on the show. Thank you for supporting this show, and until next time, have a good one, guys. Hey, don't forget, subscribe to the Winning Cures Everything podcast on iTunes, and make sure you leave a review. For every 25 written five-star reviews we get on iTunes, we are donating to St. Jude's Children's Hospital and Le Bonheur's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So subscribe and review on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all your favorite podcast apps. Remember, the Winning Cures Everything podcast.